Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie Right, you're very welcome along to Friday Night Racing, brought to you in association with Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment, visit hri.ie or follow the Twitter account at HRI Racing and the hashtag is every racing moment. Our guest this week is jockey Colin Keane. Colin, how are you getting on? I'm not too bad, Jar. How are you keeping? I'm very well and Johnny Ward is with us as ever. Johnny? How are you getting how are you, on, Johnny? Lads? How are you, Johnny? All well? All good, Colin. Yeah, you're uh, near, it's, it's getting closer. Yeah, we're counting down the days now. We're... Not too far away, thank God. Uh, I know we've. Uh, I know a lot of people have kind of you know given out about racing being off, but to think that racing is back on Monday in in uh, Britain is something else, and uh, then it'll just be uh, a nice kind of weekend to the Irish, and we'll hopefully be back to normal. I think everyone in racing is very excited, and I'm sure you are. Exactly. Yeah, as I say, we're just counting down the days now, and uh, can't wait for it to get going. What's the break been like? Is there any part of the break that you're going to think, actually, I'm going to miss that little bit of extra time I had to do whatever or to rest my body? What's it actually been like for you? Uh, maybe. Uh, it's nice at the start for a week or so, but after that it gets, I suppose, tedious and you're just mad to get going, basically, because what you're used to being racing every day. Uh, but now we're we're definitely fresh and we're ready to go. How is your body as a, an elite athlete um, who, you know, rides a massive, huge beast and uh, at a very fast pace? How, like, how do you get back to the level where you were at the end of last season, for example? Um, well, to be honest, I've been, I've been riding out every day since, so not much changed that way. Um, I wasn't running for a couple of weeks, and I started running the last two weeks or so just to get fit again. But as I say, I know we're... We're ready to go now. And is that all you need to do? Like for to, for you to feel com confident next week when you're under starters' orders in Nace, it'll be like, yeah, I'm my fitness is perfect. I'm 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 ready to go. Uh, as much as I can do, I suppose, without racing. Um, the more racing there is, the better for fitness. After a week or so, you're fairly settled back into it, to be honest. Right. And psychologically as well, I'm always interested in that. Like, when, when will you feel like, OK, I'm in the flow again, this is all very normal for me? Because I'm trying to establish, essentially, what's the difference between riding out when everybody's making sure that the horses are getting fit and being well to a race where everybody is going as fast as they possibly can and getting the most out of each other and the most out of the, the horse. Yeah, that's what I say. Uh, race, the race fitness is probably a little bit different, but after a week or so, you get back into the swing of things. As a home, you wouldn't be as hard on the horses or yourself, uh, but just after a couple of days or a week or so, you're back to normal, I think. Have you been watching races back to try and get your, your eye in about like uh, what it's actually going to be like when there is somebody trying to slit your throat, essentially, in the, on the horse beside you? Yeah, pretty much. But just watching replays from last year or early on in the winter, or I should say down in the dock or something, just to keep the, the head right. But no, we're looking forward to it now. And is that the same? Is that good enough? Or are you like, ah, oh, does it make it a little bit worse? Geez, I really wish I was in the middle of that race again. Uh, no, it just gives you something, I think, to look forward to and just get, re just get back to it. What's the complexity of this being like for the likes of Ger Lines, uh, Colin, and your dad? in terms of training horses kind of for targets that they don't really know exist anymore or moving targets and going from training a horse to be ready to race and then no racing and then I suppose keeping them half ready and then trying to get the whole kind of 100% uh, out of it again. What's that been like for them? Yeah, well, a lot of our horses were ready to, to go at the start of the year and it's especially the horse that wants off ground. Um, they've kind of missed their chance, I suppose. Uh, but... Jared kind of just backed off them for a few weeks, freshened them up and gradually twisted the screw again with them and they all seem ready to go now. And how about your dad? Because, like, you know, the, the, the trainers at that sort of a scale, they've, they're, they're winners every year. They wouldn't have an awful lot of horses and, you know, they have to deal with owners. Like, has it been tough for him to keep the show on the road? It actually probably suited my father a little bit because he's busy with pre-trainers for Jer and his string as such would be a little bit behind. So mm. they were catching up in that time, to be honest. And how long is that relationship with uh, the pre-training for Jer going on? Uh, it's going on three years now, I think. It's, it seems to be working, thankfully. 
And is that, is that something that like a lot of the smaller trainers is something that they'd kind of be attracted to in terms of the economic boost of the pre-training and you know the the guarantee of of making some money out of it? I suppose it's each their own. Um, mm. My father, he's he had plenty of horses years ago, but for what things didn't go right for him, and he's making a, a good living from pre-training for Jer and for other people, so he he's happy. Mm. What has it been like down in, in Jerry Lyons over the last while, obviously? Because it, it's kind of a real sense of um, a coming force over the last number of years to the point where, you know, he puts out a lot of horses that he realistically expects to win a lot of races. So when there is a, an interruption in that, it's just, it's not easy for anybody, but particularly when you've built up momentum over the last number of years, you're like, come on, let's get back out there. Yeah, he's been he's been very level-headed. There's not much he can do about it. It's nothing, it's out of his control. Um, so you just take it day by day and that's what he did and as I say we're just ready to go now. Have you been riding out just there or have you been riding out in other places as well? Between Jer's and my father's basically. Uh, ride the odd piece of work for other people when I can if they want me. But I'm between both yards mainly. And was, uh, was it always kind of likely that this was going to be your uh, career? How did you get into it from... Uh, I suppose, what age were you when you started and was it something your dad encouraged or was he uh, hoping you'd do something else? Um, I suppose I had ponies from a very young age, did plenty of hunting and show jumping and then took the next step to do pony racing. We had a couple of ponies ourselves. We had a right little 14-hander pony. She was uh, bought cheaply and she turned out to be, she won over 35 races. She was a real good one. Uh, but they're the type of ponies I think you need pony racing to teach you. And it just kind of progressed there and got my license out after my 16th birthday and just went from there, I suppose. I suppose we've spoken to uh, some of the ex-pony racing circuit. I, I, I remember Jack Kennedy obviously was was a notably um, kind of big recruit from the pony circuit. But how, could you explain to people what it's like? And you're so young as well and all the excitement of going to these races and riding in them. Yeah, exactly. Your early teens or less even uh, riding around the field in uh, 13 or 14 horses, horses and ponies. Some uh, A lot of the uh, bigger horses would be off the track for if they have problems or whatever. And it's just a great experience, basically, uh, getting to push a horse, ride a ride race, be in a position. Um, no, it's, it's, it stood me well. Do you get to know the other riders then at the time? You're all kids, obviously. Exactly, yeah. It's interesting to see a group of you come along together and then get your license together. Um, like I, at my time, it was Ross Coakley, Kevin Sexton, Danny Benson, Megan Carberry. We were all kind of at the same age coming on together. And obviously, Paul Townend was ahead of us. Jack Henry was behind us. You know, it was each year or every couple of years different young lads come out from it and like Dylan McGonagall now he's a very good young rider so mm. when, you, when you're at a, a pony race and you're up against you know fairly very talented horse people who you know you, you kind of are going to be up against and competing are you very competitive at that stage or are you just there having the crack like what, what was your mindset at that stage uh, I suppose the older you are at it, the more serious it becomes. When you're starting off younger, it's it was probably about enjoying it and learning. And the older you get at it, it comes becomes more serious, definitely. Yeah. And as part of the it becoming serious in your own head, you're thinking, I want to do this for my job. This is what I want to be. I want to be a jockey. I've decided. Yeah, it'd be yourself and for the people you're riding for. They they, they take it serious. <laughs> So you obviously did decide kind of in your teens that you wanted to be a jockey. If you're, if you're getting your licence at 16, from the time you're 12 or 13, you're, that's what you have your eye on. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I wasn't great at school, so that was my only other option. Yeah, the, 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 I remember the, your, your start as well fairly well. I think we're talking 10 years ago now or so, you were sort of riding and um, came to the fore at Dundalk. What, what was that like? Because you were riding for your dad. I remember you, were, you racked up a sequence on a horse whose name I forget now, a middle distance horse. But you, you, you kind of came to prominence yourself and 
Connor King around that time um, would have been the talk of punters. What was it like as a young jockey kicking straight into Dundalk? And essentially, you're looking at Pat Smullen, you know, um, Shamie Heffern and uh, Declan McDonough, riders like that. You're riding against basically the best in the world and you're thrown straight in into the, the in, into a tricky track that is Dundalk as well. Yeah, it's a big shock to the system, so it is. Um, these are the lads you look at on telly and you look up to and then to be riding against them it's a bit daunting, but after a couple of rides and nerves settle down, you get the hang of things and you really start to enjoy it. I was lucky enough to, I was riding for my father for the first few rides, so there wasn't too much pressure on it. I think my what? seventh ride, I had the winner, and so it kind of all was uh, straightforward, you could say. And what, his relationship with you, like, what was it like? Because some fathers kind of, they, you know, they take very little interest in their kids' sporting activities. Others take almost too much interest. Um, some parents can be very supportive some can kind of knock you down and kind of bring you up different ways so what was your relationship like with your dad as you came along the years uh, my father he'd be fair, very laid back man but if he thought he did something wrong he'd tell you he wouldn't hold back on it but no he he was very good to me now and i suppose he had the right attitude for um uh, a jockey who was definitely shown talent but also i mean i, I mean obviously at the start you're going to make a lot of mistakes and need time Exactly, yeah. He'd never force anything on you. He'd let you want to do it or want to do it yourself, you know, and if you need to correct him, he was there for it. And were the jockeys kind of welcoming or were they, was it, a, as you said, it was daunting. Was it, did you get to know them fairly quickly? I, I you do. Uh, the weigh room was a great place. It's a great bunch of lads. They're all very welcoming, welcoming and they, they make you feel at home. Mm. I mean, he must have been unbelievably proud. Seven races in and you have a winner in Dundalk like you know I, I'm sure he was trying not to um, transmit any nervousness on his behalf I, you said he's very laid back but you must be nervous for your own child on you know one of your own horses in this scenario because there's all sorts of stuff going on in your head it's like Jesus is he ready for this you know if I if I wait too long to put him out when's he ever going to get the experience have I done the right thing so all that goes into that whole relationship too that probably when you're 16 you're just oblivious to yeah exactly um like the the filly that we won on uh no trimmings was her name she was after That's winning right. as a she won a handicap as a three-year-old and she kind of lost her way a bit um davy moran got off her one day and said just try the young lad on her put blinkers on her and try and take 10 pounds off her and see does it work and it worked and we ended up winning three or four on her. She was a she was a good filly for me, so she was. And the man, the owner Lee McHugh, is a, he's a lovely man. We actually have a filly out of her now. She's a three year old as well, Miss Molly T, which is hopefully one to look forward for, to for this summer. I suppose that was the horse that kind of maybe, kind of got you going to an extent. And then it must be really really nice to see the offspring, and you're going to be riding that in the future as well. Exactly, yeah. She was a she was a lovely mare to learn on, and to, as you say, to have her daughter with us now is is great. So that's twenty ten, and you're sixteen. I think um, the first time kind of the whole country starts to take notice might be twenty fourteen when you finish uh, second in the champion apprentice race. Is that right? With fifty odd winners that year. That's right. Yeah, I think we were second to Connor by he beat us by two winners maybe. Mm. Which, yeah. yeah, that was our first year with Jerry, I think. That was the, so how the, did the move, thing there. How did the move to Jerry come about? What, what's that, what is that process where a promising young jockey comes through and a trainer goes, ooh, I like the cut of your jib. How does that work? Well, the, my fa, we were, he was starting to downsize as such and he said, basically, you need to go and find a job somewhere. So I was thinking about going to England and my agent Rory Tierney rang me said there's an apprentice race there in Dundalk and you can ride for Jair Lines. I said okay he said uh, he wants you to go up and sit on the horse so I went in to ride out for Jair and then I asked him for a job riding out and that's basically how it happened then went that, from there that day what? that day you, the conversation is can you get up here and this is going to Stick in the apprentice race. I will, yeah, but you have to give me a job. Is that how it worked? <laughs> Not exactly like that, but that's the short of it. 
Right. Jer is, Jer is an interesting... Well, both Jers are very interesting characters, but Jer uh, lines, he doesn't take any missing. So, like, what was your first sort of impressions of the big man? Uh, from day one, we've got on. Um, I would I don't say a whole pile, so I just kept my mouth shut, went in and worked <laughs> away. <laughs> and how did the ride go? Uh, he was... I think he was placed... I won on him the second time, but he was placed the first time. I think he was third or fourth or third. And then I won on him. Uh, Shukov was his name. Oh yeah. So you're. Are you thinking then, like, as much as Jer has grown and grown, that was a that was a hell of a job to get at that stage. Oh, I know. Yeah, I was just delighted to be in the yard. Um, coming obviously, my father being such a smaller yard and not the quality of horses that Jer had, just to get in and ride out them types of horses, I was delighted. They must have been quite a confidence boost though, as well, where that conversation goes well. Like, obviously. Your, apprentice, your agent has had a conversation with them about this, and so you're on the radar there. But to, to essentially be given a job very early on would suggest that he had spotted something in you that he wanted to be in the yard on a regular basis and also kind of groomed for the next job. Yeah, well, I, I, don't, know how to, I don't know if it started out that way and it just kind of led to that. Um, but as I say, we were just lucky he took us on because otherwise we could be in England going up and down the country. But how many other people was he taking on at that stage? Like, I'd say in his head, he's definitely, like, not taking on... He's not taking on any owl mug, is he? Well, I was the only apprentice there. To, I was the only apprentice because Gary Carroll and Emmett McNamara were the, the main two jockeys there. Yeah. Yeah, and Gary would have, like... Gary would have shared an apprentice title as well, I think. But to be fair to to be fair to you, yourself and Connor King around that time, you had kind of made... A serious impression, and you had shown that, like you, you, you had a very nice style of riding for a young lad. I think he was probably, I think he probably knew he was buying, like say, an, an eighteen or nineteen year old footballer, like that has a, an awful lot of potential. He probably knew he was probably getting in a bit ahead of the market, maybe. Maybe he did. I'm not sure. You're too, you're <laughs> too humble here, Colin. That's the problem. You're, you're too <laughs> well, humble. Well, it's, it's very interesting you say that, though, because, like, Jerry, you often mention sliding doors moments, but if Colin goes to England, and England can become a bit of a rat race, so how do you think that might have gone for you? Had you any idea where you would have gone, like trainers, would you have gone north or south, or had you? what did you in mind? Uh, as far as I know, we were going to get a trial with Mark Johnson, um, but he, I think he was, he was more looking for a, a natural light rider that could do the bottom weights, and I couldn't do that, so... It, to be honest, it probably wouldn't have worked out, and I'd probably be uh, travelling the length of breadth of the country in England. Sorry, excuse yeah, my I, ignorance here. Explain that. He wanted a natural rider to do the bottom weights. What does that mean? A natural live weight jockey, like that could walk around eight four. My bottom weight is uh, eight eight, basically, and I I wouldn't do them light weights. Okay, so yeah, that would have been yeah. too much of a struggle. Or you just yeah. couldn't do them? Yeah. I just couldn't That's do them. Yeah. As much as as much as you're well known for your front running tactical nous and that, would it have been attractive to you to ride for Mark Johnson in the sense of how he likes his horses ridden? It's kind of fairly one dimensional. And um, was that an aspect of your thinking at the time? Uh, no, I can't say it was. To be honest, mm. <laughs> no. Well, Johnny, you you explain it because obviously you know Colin is quite humble here. Front running yeah, tactical nous. Explain that. Well, yeah, like Mark, Mark Johnson is a very set way of training. Um, I personally, I find these horses very hard to predict. But the, you know, he, he trains them. They 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 race. Um, you know, he's a particular business model. Um, but for Colin, like I think, you know, we we shouldn't underestimate the importance and the value of being able to live in your own country. And like Colin, is that something that you've probably thought about since? And that like I could have, it, it could have gone the other way in England. If you have if you have a bad year or two, you might just start doubting yourself. Exactly. Yeah, that's why. I'm blessed that uh, I've stayed here and just the way it has worked out. And it, it's just, there, there isn't so much travelling as well. And like we'll say, you're riding at the dock, which is just down the road. The Curra, you know, the mead tracks are all close. And, um, you know, you've a, I suppose you have a decent quality of life as well, which is important. Exactly, yeah. Our furthest trip would be Listowel or Killarney. Mm. And realistically, they're not that far away. When you go to England, that's a normal day for them, I think. You know, and did did Jer did Jer have a kind of a set like way that he wanted you to ride the horses from the get go, or is it like an individual horse by horse basis? No, he's a he's a very easy man to ride for. He doesn't really tie it out to instructions, because um, he could tell you one thing and the stalls open and the, the complete mm -hmm. opposite thing could happen. So you kind of just ride the horse, the individual as you find them, basically.
And who were you modeling yourself on in the early days, genuine in particular? Uh, I looked up a lot to Johnny Martin when I started out first. I think, uh, so he, he, wrote, he wrote a good few winners for my father when mm. he didn't have anything good enough, but I was a fellow mead man, so I uh, can't go wrong. Looked up. Exactly. How did he get on the Mount Rushmore, Ger, actually? Uh, I think Johnny Martin made it. Yeah. 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 Uh, he absolutely so... made it because I was going to insist on him. He did 100% yeah. make it. Um, yeah. Colin, when you were looking up to him, are you trying to steal his style of being a jockey? Are you, are you influenced like that? Because I'm always interested in how jockeys get better or how you, you know, because with a footballer, it's fairly obvious. You hit certain markers, you get on the ball a bit more, you dominate games a bit more. You know, if you're a defender, you, you close down crosses. But from a jockey's perspective, the wins loss ratio it either goes up or down and that's how the outside world views you as successful but what do you what do you kind of try at the start of a season to say i want to get better at certain aspects of the game how do you improve race to race well every well i suppose starting out um you look at the likes of johnny Murta and the pat smullins and you what way they ride races or where they are in races different paces of races and stuff like that and then kind of each year i started started uh, at the start of the year, you just try and beat the previous year's tally. And if you've done something wrong throughout the year or someone's getting on to you, you try not to make that mistake again or try to keep everyone happy. They're tactical mistakes you're talking about, are they, as opposed to horsemanship mistakes? Uh, a bit of both. A right. Bit of both, to be honest. What, yeah. kind of, what kind of horsemanship stuff are you, are you practicing or are you concerned about or are you, are you trying to hone and get better at? Just... Um, um, during a race or as a young lad and you're a little bit sloppy and you're all over the place and lads are getting on to you that's them, them kind of things you're, you you don't want happening basically Is that a, a mental focus? Is it a physical strength like getting stronger as you get older? What is that? It's a bit of both it's a bit of both um, just being aware of the people around you safety first do you know? I'm always always fascinated by how you kind of improve and, and Ultimately, it comes down to winners. That was the first thing you reached for there. I want to beat my tally from last year. First year, you're runner-up um, in the apprentice race. Second year, you're just runner-up in the overall race, and it's only Pat Small and the Hedia. So that's a fairly meteoric rise when you go from first year, Jerry Lyons, amazing success. Second year, also amazing success. Yeah, well, that's Jerry Lyons in a nutshell, basically. The horse, since I've been there, the horse each year have just improved and improved. And it's very hard to win race on bad horses. What is his? What what sets him apart as a trainer? What sets him apart? He's uh, his attention to detail is second to none. He's very patient with a horse, and he he gives them all the time in the world if they need it. And he's just he's just very good at what he does. And the um, I suppose the you know you're coming into last year and you you fall upon this two year old um called Siskin and was it obviously he's a, he's a striking horse I saw the photos of him I think from at the races there on Instagram the other day he looks an unreal Nick as do a lot of people I suppose in the weather at the moment but was he immediately impressive as a two year old when you started riding him yeah pretty much from day one he was a very straightforward horse and he always showed us that he had a, a high level ability at home and then he brought it to the track and I think he progressed with every run yeah and like you, I know you rode Laganor Twin in, in Italy and you you won a very very well placed group one for Tony Martin, but was this the horse that you'd been kind of waiting for? Yeah, I think so. Um, especially to get it for the boss. Uh, I think uh, I needed to repay him for all the confidence he put me in, put into me as a young jockey. And it just, especially for the owners as well, to have them, we only have them in the yard. That's our second season. And to get such a good horse for them is... Very important. I remember when he won at the Curra, and um, I think it was the same day that the Curra had some issues with, um, with the, uh, I think the electricity went out or something. There was there were a couple of teething problems, and I remember <laughs> meeting Ger before the race. This was uh, trying to think which day this was. Now it was probably Marble Hill. It was, say. It was either the railway stakes or the Marble Hill. But I remember, <laughs> I remember. Ger was getting a bit agitated when the um, when the lights went out because you could tell the pressure was there. And I remember meeting him immediately after the race and this unbelievable sense of relief. It was that you could just tell that he put so much stock in this horse. And I know things went 
completely kind of um, awry at Newmarket in the year. But just th that day at the Curragh, he obviously has invested an awful lot of faith in this horse. And he is kind of, I suppose, his horse of, of a lifetime so far as well. Exactly, yeah. and it was a big shout for him as well to ask could he go by Ascot and come straight to the to the curve for the railway, and they put their faith in him, and thankfully it paid off. What happened at Newmarket? I don't know. Hmm. Being honest, it happened very uh, very quick, and I, I don't I couldn't I couldn't give you an answer. This is the the mad thing about like horses. You put you know you put your faith into an anti post bet like this, and and it genuinely seemed if you can explain to people what happened, but it genuinely seemed the last thing anyone expected. Oh yeah, it's so unlike him. Uh, the te his temperament is to die for, and just to do something like that. He has never done that, and since he came out of the back of the stalls and walked around, picked the grass, you wouldn't even say he was after doing it. So sorry, Johnny, what did happen? So he just wouldn't, he just wouldn't load, and it was like you're talking about a proper Group One Middle Park. He Jer had planned it that he'd avoid Pinatubo in the National Stakes, which is obviously uh, turned out to be a pretty wise decision because he ends up win, winning the, the the National Stakes, one of the best performances you'll ever see. Jer targets the Middle Park, which is six furlongs as well. Everything looked in place, and then Colin he just doesn't go into the stalls. No, he he went in. Um, it was the second last horse was going in and he, he just somersaulted in them mm. and obviously he couldn't run after that then mm. that must be also fairly scary that's a bit frightening but sure <laughs> it'll be alright do you does, uh, he, does he land on you or do you kind of squirt out the bottom what happened I actually jumped in beside Wayne Lauren well uh, Lord he grabbed me out of the way thankfully right because yeah. you know those are very confined spaces designed specifically so that there isn't that much room for the horse to move. So unbelievable athleticism to be able to to somersault in the first place. But then also I I, I do guess pretty scary for you. And then obviously now favourite for the two thousand guineas, which is what less than two weeks away, two weeks away tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but he's he's done very well over the winter, and he's in great nick now. So we're we're just looking forward to that. And how, how is the prep? Sorry, Ger. How is the prep being? What with the year we've had and all that, and obviously this is Aidan O'Brien might do it, but it's fairly unusual for a trainer to go straight into an Irish Guineas without a run. It's uh, it's probably suited him actually. The more time he's got, the better he's become. Um, as I say, he looks a picture now. He's training real well, so we're we're very happy with him. Mm. And you're you're avoiding pin a tubo as well, which is no harm. Exactly. Yeah. Would you feel the pressure now coming to the day? Like, is this would would this be a particularly special race for you? Probably the most um, the highest profile ride you'll probably ever have today. It'll be him in the guineas. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there will be a little bit of pressure, obviously, but it's uh, I think it's what you want. It's the type of horses you want to be riding on in them sort of races. What do you make of his trip for the year? We'll find out after next weekend. Ah, come on. Give, give me more than that now. He's never raced beyond six furlongs. He's going to a mile. Punters are desperate for something to back. Give us more than that now. He, uh, all I'll say is he'll give, him every ch he'll give himself every chance to stay. He's a very relaxed horse. So we'll find out together. Lovely. Colin, you must feel like you're, you're cresting to a peak in your own career at the moment then. And obviously there's been a, a bunch of months lost here and there's nothing you can do about that. But... It, it seems like you feel very confident in your own abilities now. The level of experience you have is, is the right amount of experience for whatever scenarios you're, you're about to face. You've, you've basically faced almost everything that you possibly can as a jockey at this point, but you're still young and have the athleticism that uh, a young jockey should have. So is this, do you feel like you're cresting to a peak? Um, I, th I think so. I think my, my riding has improved with each year. As I say riding good horses nice horses each year is a big help and i think we're ready for uh the guineas now in it two weeks and we're looking forward to it are there defeats that you look back on now that you think geez if only i had that back and knew what i know now i'd be able to fix that uh not really i don't try and overthink about getting beat on too many because it'll only bring you down i think that's an interesting, an interesting way of looking at it. And like, what is your approach to races in terms of are you much of a form judge? Do you watch replays back much and all that? I'd I'd watch a lot of replays. All right, yeah. Uh, I just know where the pace is, and after that, I kind of 
we ride them as we find them. And and Siskin in the Guinea, the Curra is obviously like a very, very fair mile. And, you know, no wonder Aiden loves running horse at the Curra because basically the best horse tends to win. But what's it like riding a horse that's stepping up two furlongs in trip uh, at the Curra? Like what, what would make the Curra any different to anywhere else for riding a horse that is stepping up in trip in a race of that nature? First run of the season as well. Well, he, he's, he's three from three at the track, so we know he likes the track. Mm. I know I know it'll be his first time going that trip, but we give him a ch- give him a chance, to let him take his time a little bit, and give him every chance to get the mile. Where where does this come up in your favorite tracks to ride? Yeah, it'd be it'd be up there. The likes of Curra, Leopardstown, Dundalk, they're they're all good tracks to me. And Nace, obviously, them mm. they'd be my four picks, I think. Can I ask you about actually being in a race and, and when the adrenaline kicks in? Is it just before the stalls open? Is that the period where you're kind of at your most agitated because you don't know what's going to happen? Or is it later on as you're coming to the finish line with a chance of winning? Uh, it's probably, yeah, just as you're about to jump out is the most nerve-wracking or butterflies in your stomach. That would be the, the most of it, I think. Do you enjoy that bit? Is like Because there's a kind of... Uh, Slightly masochistic feeling where it's like, okay, this, this could go either way here. But that must be the most exciting bit. I think it's good, yeah. It's, a, it's excitement and looking for, ready for it, buzz of it. Uh, it's something to look forward to. Yeah, and then close finishes, what are they like to be in? Yeah, good if you're on the right side of them. And, mm. and so when you're not, what do you do now? You, like, you've, you've obviously, this is, this is the thing. It's like it, most sports, the aim is to win every time. You're out there with the jockey. If you've had ten or twelve or fourteen percent winning streak, you're like one of the best jockeys that's ever lived. So, most of your career is like defeat, 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 win, defeat, 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 and that's just how it is. So, like, how do you not let that get into you over a period of time? Well, if there's not much you can do about it, um, if it's your own fault, obviously you hold your hands up, apologize to the trainer, say what you should have done instead of doing what you did, and. If there's not much, you, if there's not much you did do wrong and it ran to the best of its ability, well done. <laughs> mm. How would you assess the quality riders in Ireland at the moment? Your 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 old rival Pat Mullen um, and your old rival Donnick O'Brien both retired, and who's sort of, I suppose, coming up to take their place to your mind? You could name any amount of riders. Ireland's mm. very so competitive, so so it is. Mm. How would it compare to Britain? Well, I. Uh, I'm not too sure because I don't ride in Britain enough, but mm. it's competitive enough over here. To... Yeah. Um, what about the young lads coming up? You mentioned Dylan McGonigal, actually. There is a nice crop of young riders at the moment coming through, even though it, it, you'd nearly forget about them. It's been so long away, but who who should people be looking out for? Uh, obviously, Dylan looks like a very talented young rider. Gavin Ryan, Andrew Slattery. You could, I, you could, you could be here all day naming them, to be honest, I think. And in terms of the equine uh, comparables from that, what sort? What are the quality of your two-year-olds this year? Any horses to look out for? Uh, we look like we have a lovely mixed bunch of Cole Sand fillies. Uh, we don't have too many sharp horses. Uh, we have a handful for maybe six furlongs, but the majority of them will be seven furlong to milers. But uh, and- they look a nice bunch. And do you, do, you, do you envisage it being much different when you come back on Monday week in that, you know, jockeys are obviously a little bit not race fit because they haven't been riding, the horses haven't been racing. Do you think form will be reliable or is there going to be a case of like we're slightly kind of in the dark here to a little degree for punters to know kind of what you should be going for? Uh, I don't think so. I think everyone will be, as I say, raring to get going. So I think all the trainers will have their horses fit and... All the jockeys are mad to get going, so they'll have themselves as fit as they can. As I say, after a couple of days of race riding, they'll be—I think—they'll be back to normal. It is. It obviously has been a wild period in the world because of what's been happening. But we are entering a phase now where all going well and everything being successful, we're about to enter into a fairly mad period from a racing perspective as well, where I'll, the calendar for the rest of the year gets uh, concertina into quite a short period of time, which means there's good quality, big races, big purses every week, essentially, for the next 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks. Exactly, yeah. For the first month, I think we've only two days off, so that's great. We're helter-skelter for the first month. 
and I'll be racing every day, so I can't wait for that. Yeah, you wouldn't want it any other way. Well, Colin, thanks very much. Best of luck uh, next week when racing comes back and continued success. It's been a remarkable story so far. I wish yourself and Ger Lyons all the best with it. Thanks a million for joining us. Thanks, Colin. Well, thanks. Colin Keane with us this week on uh, Friday Night Racing. Johnny, we're nearly back to um, to getting some tips. I don't know if you've been looking at the racing in the UK, but um, certainly this time next week we'll be expecting tips from you. I noticed that your line of questioning in recent weeks has been, you know, we don't really have any form. Are the horses fit? Are the jockeys mm. uh, are the jockeys actually going to be ready for this? Essentially, you've been getting your excuses in before the bad tips reemerge. Uh, I think you're kind of slightly putting words in my mouth there, but yes, yes, that is accurate. Um, you know, pre-made excuses um, make you sound like you kind of half expected to fail in the first place. Fail better, as Beckett might say. But um, I am looking forward to coming back. But I would, like, I was kind of alluding to it there, Jar. I would be a little bit wary um, in the er in the early few fixtures. You kind of want to suss things out, and even for somebody who punts on horses, like I basically haven't had a bet now in three months. So you're kind of like you're you're out of the habit of like looking up form all the time. And I got. You know, we a lot of punters have horse trackers dec uh, entries update, and I got a a horse has been declared email during the week, and I was like, "What the hell is this?" And it brought me back to literally three months ago because I've there've been no horses entered. So you know, Aidan O'Brien and, and the top trainers are going to have their horses ready. Um, but I, I just be I just be a little bit wary. I'm I'm obviously looking forward to seeing Siskin. I think if he stays, he's a massive chance. And obviously Penatubo, then if he can train on, which he should train on, and kind of prove to be as spectacular as he looked at that day at the Curra, it was one of the most outstanding performances I've ever seen. But uh, it's going to be great getting racing back. You know, I, I will reiterate this. Um, you know, as much as it's great to get racing back behind closed doors, is far from ideal going forward. It really has to be a temporary thing, and I, I hope the government moves on that quickly because um, you know race courses are under serious pressure, and, and even going back behind closed doors is is nowhere near that their business model. So hope. Hopefully, uh, sooner or later, we get sort of, you know, some sort of attendance back. And there was a, a fascinating piece with Kevin Prendergast uh, recently in the Racing Post where he was bemoaning the fact that uh, neither he, he nor Derma Well could go racing because of their age. And he said, John Ox, I think he crept in, he got in by a month. And you're kind of thinking of the underage footballer who was born in January, January as opposed to December. And I was born in November. That's why I was useless when I was younger. But at the same time, the, the fact that John Ox can go racing but Derma well can't because of a quirk of the pandemic kind of um, approach. It's it's just mad times when you think about it. Absolutely. And Kevin Prendergast is like, I think he's 88 in a couple of weeks. And he said, this is a nonsense that I can't go racing. And you just have to admire lads like that. This, uh, you know, and, and he's still very excited about Mad Moon as a four-year-old. And just the, the, the whole, what a man basically, but he can't go racing. Yeah. However, one other thing that we should kind of speak about briefly before we wrap up here is that there's a big window of opportunity for the sports which come back first to get new people interested and to try and convert them into uh, long-time users of that sport into the future. It's a little bit like the stats that came out during the week that said we've never been more active than we have been over the yes. last month or so, where Sport Ireland in their annual survey, it turns out we're all cycling, we're all going running, we're all doing stuff that we were kind of putting on the long finger and that the gender gap in um, sport has completely collapsed where previously there were fewer women than there are men doing sport and sporting activity that has now completely collapsed for the benefit of the country as a whole also racing is going to be on tv a good bit more now over the next while and uh, i think there's a big opportunity for it 100 percent yeah all, all you're saying there i completely agree with you know i found early on in the lockdown um i i play astroturf so that's my general sort of exercise but i had a hamstring injury so i hadn't been really playing going into the lockdown and then obviously the lockdown came so i wasn't going back and i found uh, getting into a real rut where i wasn't doing exercise so it, it kind of compelled me to do it and i think an awful lot of people and as much as social media you know it's not the panacea for anything really like a lot of people were putting up that they were doing their 5k runs on social media and people were probably nearly guilted into putting their togs on on man, woman and child and going out and some of the things I've seen in the Phoenix Park where I've seen a daddy running with his son or daughter or, or, or dog or the family running together or cycling together and all this stuff. The Phoenix Park last night was absolutely off the charts. All of the various activities that were going on there and getting back to the second part of your question, racing has a massive opportunity and um, the fact that it's on RTE um, I think is, is, is clever on this by RT because obviously its schedule has been decimated but we really do have a chance to try to sell the product here because there's so little on and I hope that the coverage of it gives it the sort of um 
the quality it deserves because there's so much going on in a horse race. It's not horses running around the field alone. There's so much going on. We have the best horses, the best jockeys in the world. Brilliant, but very different race tracks. There's an awful lot of nuances of tactics going on. Um, and why not give it a try? You know, that 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 hour long show that RT is going to have, um, I think I think is a really great initiative and will bring uh, floating voters to the sport whether they like it or not. So there is an opportunity, Jerry. I hope the League of Ireland kind of maybe can sense that as well soon enough that there isn't much football on. If we can get the League of Ireland back, it'd be an opportunity to sell that as well as overseas to people who might want to watch sports. So in crisis, there's always opportunity. Another hundred euro donation brings the Tote Irish Injured Jockeys Fund all the way up to 1,540 euros. With the UK racing back next week and the start of Irish racing looming on the horizon, we are starting to get a sense of normality, including, as I said, the imminent return of Johnny Ward's weekly tips. The Bank Holiday weekend will see the first classics of the season with the Poule d'Essai des Poulins and Poule d'Essai des Pouliches coming from Deauville on Monday. Don't miss any of the action with full betting and streaming available on the tote.com. This week's Friday Night Racing is in the books. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Check out at HRI Racing on Twitter and the hashtag Every Racing Moment. We'll see you next Friday. Bright eyed and bushy tailed. Johnny, have a good weekend. Same to you, Ger. Cheers. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.